They won't. What? You can hear me? Yes. All right, so it's all good. So um, I've never done this before. And I was thinking one of my favorite songs, one of the lines says, if I claim to be a wise man, it surely means I don't know. So I'm not claiming to be a wise man. <laughs> so I thought um, maybe I think in eight or ten years ago, I thought it would be really nice to come up with parts of the Bible that are very meaningful for times of trouble, like right when you're getting mad or frustrated or worried or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever goes on. And so, and for my case, it needs to be short so I could remember it. <laughs> and so, um, and, I, and I really suggest just try to find meaningful verses like that. So the one I picked, I think about eight years ago, said, it was the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And which I think just means it'll be okay, right? No matter, no matter what happens. It doesn't mean it's going to be great, but it means it's going to be okay. So I like that. And then I was talking, I went to Texas recently to visit my cousins on the once every 40 years, whether you need to. <laughs> and one of my cousin's wife teaches um, um, Bible studies for women all the time. And she, I told her this, and she said her part uh, that she likes out of Psalm 23, it says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Because thy rod means like the thing you beat the sheep with when they're not behaving. And so kind of sounds like if you said, my dad's belt comforts me. It's like, really? <laughs> but then I, when I thought about it, it is. I mean, it's really nice when you're a kid. If you, have the right, if you have a nice family and your father's got everything under control and you can just be a kid and no worries and occasionally get in trouble because you did something wrong. <laughs> but, you know, that's the way it goes. And so, um, so, so what I thought, one of the things my father taught me is, you know, and I had this problem with my kids too, is like kids just like have things, like they don't like to go to school sometimes for no apparent reason. Just, you know, it's a thing, right? That it's not fun and they just don't feel like it. And my dad, I mean, my dad's going to move here, I hope, next year so you can meet him. And he's just this really calm, logical guy. He doesn't go around making a statement or being all dynamic. He's just quiet and... So if you sat there and didn't want to go to school because you were like sick, kind of, he would, you know, it's logical to think, well, if you're sick, you should go to bed so that you're getting well. Mm -hmm. So he had this thing that if you can't go to school, you got to go to bed for half the day. And he meant half the whole day, not half the school day. And that works out to be like eight hours and school is only like six hours. So, <laughs> so it's not worth it to pretend to be sick ever. And back, especially when I was growing up, we didn't have TVs and video games and all this cool stuff in your room. So you're sitting there lying in bed, staring, wishing you were dead. <laughs> so it just was not worth it at all. And so, and I remember, uh, yeah, I remember thinking about it like, it almost like if I threw up or something, it'd be like, yeah, no, that was the dog. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm going to school. Never mind, we don't have a dog. That, there's no way that was me, and I'm well. But I learned from that that. You should just go to school because you're supposed to. And then as an adult, that translated into, you should just go to work, you know. And it just, there's things in life you should just do because you just should. And it was really great to learn that from my dad. And so then I was trying to pass this down to the next generation, although I'm not sure I did as well as my dad. But um, so my daughter, Laura, that comes here in fourth grade, had this teacher, Mrs. Sack, that, um, you know how Cruella DeVille had those cigarettes she smoked on the end of the plastic. Yeah. I've never seen that in real life except this Mrs. Sack had this thing and she, there, she was smoking the foot-long cigarettes. <laughs> and she had this gray sunken skin yeah. and she had this smoker's voice and she'd come like, oh, Laura, how's it going? You know, and it, oh, she was so... <laughs> <laughs> and one day Laura just could not handle it and just didn't want to go to school. And, I, and we're there telling her, no, you, you got to go to school. You, you just have to. It's not even optional or anything. And we saw, I finally like, getting on the corner, come on, come on, you got to go. And I, and I told her, but you know, if you, see a fly, if you see a house flying through the sky, don't be standing next to, next to Mrs. Sack. <laughs> and so she told one of her friends, and I guess that went all over the school. Laura's dad says, like, fly, house flying in the sky, don't even be standing next to Mrs. Sack so you don't get squished. <laughs> it was like, oops. But, but we got the job done, and we got her to go to school, so that was cool. Okay, so anyway, getting back to the main part of the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Except I can't turn to the next page for some reason. 
<laughs> so, if you, so if I tell you that, then um, we all believe that, right? Because it's in the Bible and the logical part of our brain says, hey, that's in the Bible, so that's true and all. Except then uh, when stuff happens, you know, like when your job's not going well or your family's, not, or, you know, things happen, you get sick, whatever, you start realizing, maybe I don't actually really believe that or not as well as I should believe that. So I thought it would be really nice to, um, you know, to try to work on actually believing that on, I guess you'd call it the emotional side of you or whichever, you know, the, like the meaningful part of you needs to believe this is a true thing that, that it's going to be okay. Uh, Paul, and back in, let's go back to verse four. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Now, as a shepherd, they use the rod and the staff as protection. It's not only for correction. Right, it goes both ways. It is for um, defending off so the... it's not a bad thing. Right, I mean, there's part of it where they're defending off the, um, the lions and the bears and all these other things. Right. Oh my. So it's not all bad, but it's... <laughs> it can be a dual purpose use. Right, and, but it's, yeah, yeah, it, uh, yeah, it's definitely not all bad, but it's also not all good. <laughs> so. Well, the staff's also used to uh, separate the, the hook the sheep. Yeah, the hook thing. Yeah, the hook thing was the staff part. Seems like that might all be good, but the rods kind of goes both ways. Well, if you're a bad animal, it, 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 well, the sheep see they're they're not too bright. They tend to wander off, and they're they're not a predatory type animal. So it's they're like easily, you know, right. I think that's why they always. <laughs> I think they always compare us, us to sheep because we're also not all that bright, and we tend to wander off. <laughs> So, um, so in this, uh, I shall not want, it's like, that doesn't mean everything's going to be great. I mean, there might be other parts of the Bible that say that, but that part only just says it's going to be okay. And like one thing, we've never done this before, but we replanted our orchard this year, and it only costs like a fortune. <laughs> and so this verse does not mean it's going to be awesome and it'll be the greatest baby orchard in the history of baby orchards or anything, which it's kind of not actually. But it's good enough. But it means it's going to be okay. It's going to work out somehow or another. And we're not going to, you know, go broke, I guess. Or, I mean, if we do, that'll be okay. But <laughs> So, um, anyway, so it's just good to keep that in mind. And I, I guess I've noticed in life that it seems like you keep having, at least I keep having the same problem, or as my dad would call it, the opportunity to learn something <laughs> until you learn it. <laughs> And so, um, you know, like when you handle certain things, like one of my examples here is, so the first car I ever bought, that's a difference between life now. I guess this was a 1988 and I got married in 1982. So it meant for six years, if my wife wanted a car, she got to drive me to work, which I don't know if people do that anymore, but it used to be you could only afford one car. So you have one car and you deal with it. But anyway, so we, you know, went all out and got her a new car in 1988. And... Um, it had 70,000 miles on it, which to me is not that much. And you know when the crankshaft sticks out the front of your car and there's all those pulleys and everything out there? She's strong and that broke off. <laughs> which I've never, ever heard of that happening to a car. And I went to the dealer and I said, really, 70,000 miles and the car is dead in a way I've never even heard of? They go, oh, no, that's great. 70,000 miles is a really nice life for your car. And, and so my solution to that is I'm not buying that kind of car anymore. And I'm not going to tell you what kind of car it was, but I'm just... No, just say no to that brand. And there's other things like, uh, you know, like if you go to Home Depot and they're not nice to you, you can go to Lowe's. And, uh, oh, and also, like in your job, I guess, you know, if it's awful, you could switch jobs. I, I had the last time I had a real job, which was in 1990. Um, they wanted me to make their thing cheap. They were making this thing and they wanted me to figure out how to make it cheaper. So I figured out how to make it for $5 instead of 10 and they were doing 10000 a month. And it was kind of cool that the first time in my life, you know, you feel like it's worth going to work, but it's like, I saved them $50,000 a month, and they're paying me like $5,000 a month, so I'm actually worth having here. This is really cool. And my boss hated that attitude. I never understood why. <laughs> but 
but it ended up, you know, you could switch for another job. And then I guess the thing that, the problem that I get to have over and over again is um, when you have a problem in a government office, and I don't mean all government offices are trouble, a lot of them are nice, but um, <laughs> when you have a trouble with them, you can't switch for the different government office because they're like a monopoly, so. So that means my favorite solution, which is don't shop there anymore, is not working when you do the government. So then you have to go find a different way. And so for one thing, let's see, I have Romans 13, 1 says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers for there's no power but for God. The powers that be are ordained by God. So it means, I mean, God put these government people there, even though I don't know why, but <laughs> he did, and we're supposed to respect that. And there's, and it doesn't say only if they're following the rules, because years ago we had some problem with fish and game, and my, they were, they were like laughing at my wife for thinking the Bill of Rights applied to her, because she thought maybe you needed a warrant to search, but they didn't think so. But, I mean, there's not a thing in the Bible that says you only have to obey the government whenever they're actually following their own rules, because <laughs> you're just supposed to obey them anyway. And so my recent example of that was, um, was uh, so we're trying to build these houses at our place. My brother and my daughter want to build a house on our farm and live there. And when we did Laurie's house, how was that only four or five years ago, right? It wasn't, they, they did things like, they didn't know how the water could go an eighth of a mile away, but they didn't say, they just said, we don't recommend it because we don't understand how you can make the water go that far, but you can do it if you want. And I thought, well, I know how to make the water. You know, you get a big enough pump and big enough pipes and the water goes wherever you want. So, so there was like rules you had to follow, but it was all right. But boy, this house is here. They have just these ridiculous and super expensive requirements that I've never heard of. Like one of them is my father has to live in one of the new houses. And I was like, what country do we live in where you tell somebody where they have to live? And, and it also says the uh, planning director can add requirements as he sees fit to the county code. It's like. So he's a dictator then and not, okay. <laughs> and so normally, I mean, normally in my job, I kept come to places and everything's all messed up and I go figure it all out and work through it and all. And I normally can do that, but not with these guys. So, um, and uh, what, what else do I want to say about it? So anyway, the guy is just like the most inflexible and unreasonable person I've ever met. We had this thing, they, they said you had to, um, I guess the times are right. They said we had to, file this form that says the water is going to come from next to my house to where the new houses are because it crosses a property line and I thought mm, whatever. And they gave us this form and they said here edit it to change it to your name and your whatever so my brother did all that. And I went in there and it had a thing that said this is an agreement between Calusa County and John Dodd that the water is going to go. And, it, and my dad had signed it and we had it notarized and whatever and the Calusa County guy didn't sign it so they said you have to go to his office and get him to sign it so I went to his office. And he said he didn't want to, so he wrote N.A. where he's supposed to sign. <laughs> so we come back to the court, they go, no, you can't put N.A. <laughs> and then they called and they sent me back to the guy and he crossed out all kinds, on this thing that's already signed and notarized, he crossed out all kinds of stuff so that he wouldn't have to sign. <laughs> and then we brought it back and then they took it and then they made us go back to bring it and it was just like, oh my goodness. So anyway, um, so then the question becomes, how do, you, how do you handle this? Because none of my normal methods of handling things would work. <laughs> So then, you know, I guess when all else fails, you got to go to the Bible and see what you're supposed to do. <laughs> so, so there's this verse that in uh, Romans 12:20 that says, "Therefore, if the enemy hunger, feed him; and thirst, let him give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head." That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> and um, I've heard that before, and I've heard people think that means that'll get him. But actually, I was talking to the pastor. He called me sometime in the week. And he said, it, and I looked it up, and it says, so for one thing, they're quoting Proverbs, which says almost exactly the same thing. And it sounds, but you know, when you think about it, that does not sound like what would Jesus do. That sounds like what would Clint Eastwood do, right? <laughs> Although it does, still sounds kind of cool. But, so, but when you look it up, um, there was people back in the time of Proverbs that, that kept a fire burning all night long. And then in the morning, they put... Uh, burning coals in an urn and carried on their head and walked around to help everyone start their fires in the morning. So apparently this putting coals of fire on their head was actually a nice thing and not, not you know, <laughs> not like burning them down or whatever. So that, so, um, and then the other thing, 
There's the story of the un, unjust judge in Luke 18 that says, uh, there was a city judge which feared not God and neither regarded man. And there was this widow in the city that came unto him saying, avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But after a while, he said to himself, though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow, widow troubleth me, I will avenge her lest her continue until she continually comes and she worries me. So it's right there in the Bible. You should go be a pain until you get your way, <laughs> until the guy just can't stand to deal with you. But that doesn't also sound like the really Christian, you know, I can't picture the pastor preaching, you know, if you have trouble, you should just go be a pain until they, <laughs> until they just want to get rid of you. And so, um, and also, after having dealt with the guy at this planning office we're dealing with, it wouldn't work. It would just probably make him happy, like, oh, I'm getting to him, yay. <laughs> so, so anyway, then the question becomes, uh, what is the Christian way to handle this? And what we did, well, one thing that was hard for me is just do whatever they want without it questioning it, because I, like my sister could tell you, I question everything all the time. <laughs> and that annoys them, so just like they'd say, do something, students like, okay, cool, let's do it. And it let it cost money, and they like to tell us that we're slow and lame and incompetent. And it's just like, all right. And we've worked on finding ways to work around the problems and being patient, which is sometimes not my strong suit, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but what can you do? And I tried to go to the county supervisor, and there's some county administrator or officer, but it didn't really help. And so then I said, when all, well, I'll, when all else fails, trust God. <laughs> And that actually worked. Because I was talking to the pastor about this opportunity to see if I trusted God on our Wednesday morning thing. And so this has been going on since, uh, like, the house has been done in January. And here a couple weeks ago, I was talking to him Wednesday morning about this is my chance to see if I really trust God or not. And that afternoon, we got the permits to build the houses. So, so yay. <laughs> so, and I guess that's... Um, I don't know what time we're supposed to end, but I guess that's all I had planned to tell. And then... Um, Your dad still have to live on the property? What? Your dad still have to live on the property? Um, yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they told me that, and I told him I thought that was, like, really un-American, but it didn't matter because he was going to live in one of the houses. And they go, oh, it's good you just made that up. I'm just like, I didn't just make that up. <laughs> I, well, so what we're doing is after we get the houses built, I'm going to... I might or might not go to wherever you go to, you know, complain. Provide feedback. What? To give feedback. That's right. Give feedback so it'll be easier on the next person who comes after to build a house. But, so, um, so we're probably not supposed to end this soon. So um, the other thing, I don't know, the pastor seems to like to tell about the history of our church, so I suppose I could do that since I know some of it. So... Years and years ago, wow, when was that? Almost 20 years ago, my dogs were all barking at night, like going crazy. I don't even, you know, dogs just do that. So I opened the door to see why. We had this 100-year-old hay barn, and it was like totally on fire, burnt down with all of our farm stuff in it. And then a couple of years later, we we were rebuilding this barn, and... Uh, you know, I asked my neighbor, who should you get to get barns? And he said, oh, this Weston building is really good. So, all right, so we got these guys. And they're there building our barn. And I noticed at break time, the construction workers are talking about their church. I thought, really? I mean, they might have been talking about who was the pretty girls of their church. I'm not sure. But, but still, they were talking about their church. And I, so I'd ask them what church this was because I thought that was really weird. I mean, just unusual. So anyway, and that was the church that the pastor taught at in um, Calusa. So the next time I was looking to a church, I went to that church. And I remember the first day I was there, the, like the youth class had gone somewhere with them on a trip, and they were all telling how, however it was. And the last girl got up there and said, she said, whatever happened, she goes, and it's really cool to see the pastor can be a dork. <laughs> and the pastor came behind her and said, hey, that's pastor dork to you. <laughs> and I thought that was just really cool. Like, it's not the end of the world, but you could, you know, you could show a small amount of respect. might be cool. And um, so I went there for a while, and then I heard he, so when he left, he didn't want to say where he's going because he didn't want to steal people from the other church, even though Calusa is like pretty far from here, but I live halfway between. So then I told him I'd like to help, and I hadn't really thought of how I wanted to help, and I, 
he wanted to go to lunch somewhere, and I kind of thought he might say that I'm one of the people why he's going for somewhere else. <laughs> but he didn't. He just said, how did I want to help? And it's like, you know, I don't know, like try to stay awake and sit in the back. Would that, would that be cool? <laughs> and he wanted to go door knocking, which almost my favorite thing. Not quite as good as teaching Sunday school, but it's right up there. The Yay, let's go do it. So we went door knocking, and, uh, and that, was, that was a really nice experience, actually. People are nice. And I, so I'm from San Jose, and people, I went with some church door knocking, and they're like, how could you be that stupid to go to church? Don't you know, understand how unscientific and dumb it is? And, uh, and, and people in Sacramento were nice. I mean, I remember some lady had like the full-on, I guess, Sikh, whatever, outfit. And she was like, oh, well, you know, we already have our temple, but good luck. And, you know, people were nice, so. So anyway, I did that, and I've just been helping here and there in the background. And now I get this new, exciting uh, stand up in front and try not to <laughs> just do what I can do. So anyway. The house is going to be ready like January then, is that? I don't know. But it's, it's, it's full. It's apparently all steam ahead. Yeah, it's um, yeah. One of the things that happened, my daughter bought this house in 2021, and since then she's gotten pregnant, and she's going to have the baby before the house. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. That's part of the part I don't get because normally, if you went to a government office and said, you know, my daughter's going to have her baby in a temporary house because you won't let her build her real house, I think a normal human would consider feeling bad about that, but not this guy. Because <laughs> some of these guys, they just have the rules and they're going to stick to the rules because... You didn't offer and then, you know, I mean, there's probably a reason. But. Yeah, I've, I've heard that from people. I can't figure out where you're supposed to... I know for the fire department that has to approve your fire sprinklers, they have these, um, they have these dinners once a month. And if you pay for the food for one of them, then you get whatever you want. <laughs> But, but I mean, the, the main thing was it's kind of cool to have gone through the process and, and get through and get done. Well, it teaches you patience. That's why you don't pray for patience, because then it's going to send turmoil and all kinds of things. To yeah. So you develop patience. Right, and I didn't go to any of these super Christian responses like, uh, I don't know if I can be as much of a pain as you, but I'm willing to try. <laughs> Just see who can... Who can do in, do in each other before you know you both wish you were dead? And just like it's not just the minute thing. It's I'm the, sorry, I can't hear. It's not just in the minute thing; it's in the whole government now. Yeah. I mean, our homeowners wants to tell us what plant we can plant in the yard. Yeah, it's. Um, it's everywhere. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of out of control, and it's. It is um, out of control. Like at some point, they said because we plowed our orchard that we can't put, build a house for three years. And it's just like, what? Well, See, and I, I get myself in trouble because they said you couldn't have a leach field. And I said, but when you do a leach field, you dig all the dirt and throw it away and replace it with gravel. So how do you care what you did to the dirt before that? And that, I'm just trying to learn, but apparently these kind of questions are deeply offensive when you have no answer to them. <laughs> it's like, I didn't mean for my question to indicate that your guys' rules are stupid, but... I accidentally did, so sorry. <laughs> so, it turned out it worked out very much better for my brother to uh, deal with them. Like I figured stuff out and then he'd call them. And then if it didn't get going pretty soon, we were going to have Laurie because Laurie can get along with everybody. Oh, that Paul Dodd guy again. Yeah. So you send your brother. They probably see me or close for lunch. <laughs> so anyway. Um, I guess that's all I have, but I, but I mean, in conclusion, I would say if you can find verses like the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want that are, that can be meaningful to whatever it is that you have struggled with the most. It's kind of weird because I actually am not generally a big worrier, but I really like that verse anyway. I should probably, you know, find similar verses for things that apply more to things I actually have problems with. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I heard it's all for funerals now. 
I don't know. It seems pretty useful for you don't need to worry about stuff while you're still alive. So um, I forget there was some other verse that I was, I don't know. But it, it's just, I mean, it seems like it'd be handy to have verses that say, like, vengeance is mine is another, you know. If you have the, if you have the Clint Eastwood, yeah, says the Lord, right. In case you have, like, the Clint Eastwood mentality of, I'm going to fix my own stuff. Yeah, I saw some movie where some priest was saying, why didn't you, uh, you know, call the cops or pray? And he goes, well, I prayed, but nobody came, so I fixed it myself. <laughs> Which, you know, it's good in a movie, but in real life, it'd be just good to, to um, you know, go to biblical solutions for your problems as often as possible if you can. So anyway, I guess that's all. I know, I was thinking I could bribe you guys to all say I didn't do good, but now we got visit.